Deep within Northern California's beautiful Lassen Volcanic National Park lies a geological oddity of great interest, cinder cone. At the surface, this 700-foot-tall volcanic edifice just looks like a regular cinder cone, but when you dig below the surface, its anomalous nature is revealed. The youngest cinder cone in the continental United States, it last erupted in 1666, making it only 359 years old. Its eruptive processes formed not only cinder cone itself, but also the fantastic lava beds and painted dunes, two landforms that surround it. The landscape created by these geological processes is absolutely gorgeous, but what is the story behind it, and why is cinder cone such a geological oddity? In today's episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures, we're going to answer all of that and more as we discuss the fascinating geology of cinder cone, the fantastic lava beds, and the painted dunes. Let's do it! As you could have probably guessed by its name, cinder cone is a volcanic edifice known as, drumroll please, a cinder cone. Also known as a scoria cone, these volcanoes are the most abundant type of volcano on Earth, with an estimated tens of thousands of scoria cones worldwide. They erode quite easily and quickly, usually taking only a few thousand to tens of thousands of years to erode. This adds to the intrigue of these volcanoes. They're still the most common volcano on Earth despite how quickly they erode. They can be found in virtually all types of volcanically active areas, from subduction zones to rift zones to volcanic hotspots and everywhere in between. At Lassen Volcanic National Park, cinder cone was generated by arc magmatism associated with the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate, or Gorda microplate if you really want to get technical, underneath the North American plate, at the southern end of the Cascadia subduction zone. To learn more about volcanism in the Cascades, click on this video. Cinder cones are also referred to as scoria cones due to the volcanic material that is ejected from them. Scoria is defined as irregularly shaped fragments of lava that are highly vesicular, meaning they have an abundance of cavities formed by air bubbles, and this is the material that scoria cones erupt. Scoria typically erupts into the air as liquid lava and cools to solid rock by the time it lands on the ground. Cinder is merely a colloquial term for small pieces of scoria. At Cinder Cone, you can really see this in action. Finer grained cinder is abundant at the top of the cone, while the bottom is flanked by large chunks of scoria. For simplicity's sake and to avoid confusion, I will refer to these landforms in general as scoria cones for the remainder of this video, but will refer to the specific cone itself by its name, Cinder Cone. Cinder Cone is one of thousands of scoria cones in the US, yet it still retains its own unique identity and status as a geological oddity. Now that we've defined what scoria cones are, let's dive into what makes cinder cone so unique. Cinder cone is the youngest scoria cone in the continental United States, last erupting in 1666. This figure is derived from dendrochemistry of dead trees in the area. When cinder cone last erupted, it wiped out much of the local forest, and scientists were able to date carbon-14 isotopes in trees that were killed from the eruption. Results yielded initial age constraints of 1650 CE plus or minus 20 years, and further analysis was able to pinpoint the exact year that cinder cone last erupted, 1666 CE. Cinder cone is chiefly composed of basaltic andesite, a mafic volcanic rock that is high in magnesium and iron. While cinder cone last erupted in 1666, there is evidence that suggests that it had two distinct phases of eruptive activity, with magmas derived from two distinct sources within the mantle, as outlined by geochemical analysis of cinder cone's volcanic material by Wolowski et al. in 2019. Both of these eruptive phases were explosive and involved lava flows. 
the fantastic lava beds and painted dunes are further lines of evidence of these eruptive phases. The fantastic lava beds are composed of basalt and basaltic andesite that flowed from the bottom of cinder cone during its most recent eruption. Scoria cones often have vents towards the bottom of the edifice that produces lava flows in addition to the scoria they eject, and this is exactly how the fantastic lava beds were formed. The painted dunes, meanwhile, are composed of brilliantly colored ash and pumice that have quite the unique origin story. The brilliant reds and oranges in the dunes are composed of iron oxide minerals that formed as ash from cinder cone fell on the earlier of cinder cone's lava flows, while that lava was still hot. This facilitated chemical reactions that oxidized the ash, giving the painted dunes their gorgeous colors. It is important to note that the painted dunes are older than the fantastic lava beds, as they formed during the earlier eruptive phase. Cinder cone erupted between 1630 and 1666 CE in two eruptive phases. The painted dunes are attributed to the earlier eruptive phase, while the fantastic lava beds originated from the latest eruptive phase of cinder cone. The two eruptive phases of cinder cone were short-lived, as scoria cones in general usually only produce eruptions that last weeks to months, though some can last years. In the case of cinder cone, the eruptive phases likely lasted only a few months each. Cinder cone can be defined as a geological oddity due to the composition of the magma that erupted out of the edifice. You see, the basalt and basaltic andesite that composes cinder cone, the fantastic lava beds, and the painted dunes is quite typical of subduction-related arc magmatism in terms of trace element enrichment and bulk composition, but it is unusually rich in quartz. Moreover, this quartz didn't actually come from the melt itself, as the volcanic rock of the area contains abundant quartz xenocrysts. Xenocrysts are pre-existing foreign materials that have been incorporated into magma, and the fact that the magma of Cindercone contains these xenocrysts is quite dubious. So, why are these quartz xenocrysts in the volcanic material from Cindercone? It has been postulated that the erupted materials of Cindercone have been quote-unquote contaminated by granitic crustal rock below the surface of the volcano, and that the quartz xenocrysts are from this granitic contamination. How and why would this occur though? Well, if we have a quick think about the regional geology of Northern California, we can piece this together. The quote-unquote backbone of California is composed of the Sierra Nevada, a significant mountain range that rises to an elevation of 14,505 feet at the summit of Mount Whitney. The core of the Sierra Nevada is chiefly composed of Cretaceous-aged granodiorite, while the western slopes of the range are largely composed of oceanic crust and accreted terrains that have been metamorphosed as they were stitched onto the western margin of North America. The Sierra Nevada extends over 400 miles from Tehachapi Pass in Southern California to Fredonia Pass just west of Susanville, where the Cascade Range picks up. The border of the Sierra Nevada and Cascade Range is denoted by a change in bedrock geology, a shift from the Mesozoic granitic rocks of the Sierra to the Cenozoic volcanic rocks of the Cascades. Here's the thing though, the granitic and metamorphic rocks of the Sierra Nevada don't just magically disappear where the Cascades pick up, they persist beneath the younger volcanic rocks of the Cascades. Fredonia Pass, which denotes the northern end of surficial outcrops of the Sierra Nevada batholith, and thus the Sierra Nevada mountain range itself, is only 27 miles southeast of Cinder Cone. In the vicinity of Cindercone, the volcanic units of the Cascades are only 2 to 4 kilometers thick, so as the magma that would eventually erupt at Cindercone traveled from a depth of about 140 kilometers where it was generated by the subduction zone, it picked up pieces of the subterranean Sierra Nevada batholith on its way up. It then erupted, forming the beautiful landscapes we see today, taking large amounts of quartz from the underlying batholith with it, making it the geological oddity that it is today. 
Further north in the Cascades, scoria cones such as Wizard Island at Crater Lake and Lava Butte near Bend in Oregon do not contain the high amount of quartz xenocrysts that cinder cone contains, as they are not contaminated by granitic rock of an underlying foreign batholith. It has been postulated that the basaltic magma of Cindercone was rapidly contaminated in the middle to upper crust during melt evolution, providing the volcanic material with its signature quartz xenocrysts. If you take a look at some satellite imagery of the area, you will see two lakes that are separated by the fantastic lava beds, Butte Lake in the north and Snag Lake in the south. These two lakes were both shaped by the eruption of Cindercone, but were shaped in distinct ways. Butte Lake used to be much larger than it is today, but it was partially filled by the lava flows of the fantastic lava beds. Snag Lake, on the other hand, did not exist until after these flows came through. The lava flows dammed the drainage into Butte Lake to form Snag Lake. Basically, the creek that filled Butte Lake was dammed by the lava flows and the damming formed Snag Lake. Pretty trippy stuff, dude. Not only is Cindercone a geologically fascinating place, it's also a beautiful area to hike in. If you ever find yourself at Lassen Volcanic National Park, I recommend driving up to Cindercone, the fantastic lava beds, and the painted dunes to hike in the area. Climbing to the top of Cindercone offers fantastic views of the aptly named Fantastic Lava Beds, as well as of the Painted Dunes and of Lassen Peak itself. From the top of Cindercone, you can actually see four different types of volcanoes. Cindercone itself is a scoria cone, Lassen Peak is a volcanic dome, Mount Tehama is a stratovolcano, and Prospect Peak to the north, as well as Mount Harkness to the south, are both shield volcanoes. Regardless of geology, the landscape around here is drop-dead gorgeous and quite interesting. This part of the park is accessed via a dirt road from California State Highway 44, and this dirt road is not too treacherous. Any car can make it. If you want to learn more about the geology of Lassen Volcanic National Park in general, click on this video. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and commenting on it, as well as subscribing to my channel, as it really helps me to get more content like this out to y'all. Thank you for watching this installment of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures, and as always, PEACE! Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. If you enjoy content like this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our other adventures right here. As always guys, thanks again and peace!